I like that countdown. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome in here this morning. We want to welcome you in. And uh, thank you for joining us here and worshiping together. It's so great to be a part of the family of God. It's great to be together here as the family of God, enjoying this time together. We really have very limited announcements, so we're going to begin worshiping here and not spending a lot of time with announcements. The only announcement really is, hey, do you like to eat? Yeah. 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 The potluck is right after uh, our worship today, the fellowship luncheon. So you're invited downstairs for that. Even if you didn't bring a dish, you are welcome to join uh, everyone downstairs following and just enjoy that time. Be together, celebrate together, and eat together, and, and enjoy that uh, conversation in that time. So, um, And that's that. How about that? Did everyone have a good week? Did everyone have a, a week? Yeah? yeah? So, had a week. So, we were a little, in a little stretch where the weeks just kind of run together. It feels like a really long week. So, that's all right. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. To God be the glory. Let's stand as we worship together. We'll begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day that you have made. I thank you that in your word, it tells us that um, even in the scriptures, when... When the writer wrote, I will rejoice and be glad in it, help us to reflect on even that simple statement that not so much that I, that I could or I can or I might, but rather I will rejoice and be glad in this day, Lord, that you have made. Lord, I give you the glory for it. I thank you for each person that's here today, that's gathered together here to worship you, to praise you, to sing your praises, to hear your praises, to read of how we praise you and to read about your grace your goodness your love your salvation for us lord through your son jesus christ we give you all glory for this in jesus name amen and amen blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name
How do we take every blessing that he pours out on us and turn that back into praise? How do we do that? We practice it each day, right? We just practice each and every day, practicing offering up our praise to him. Every blessing that he pours out to us, that we have an opportunity to return that back to him in the form of praise. Your love, O oh Lord, from the sun. Your love, O oh Lord. The Lord's righteousness. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Yes, your justice flows like the ocean tide. I lift my voice this morning and I will lift my Worship you, my King. That's where I find my strength. And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wing. Yeah, sing it God's word. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the skies. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Yes. Your justice flows like the ocean. Father, Lord, I thank you for your love, even as we sing your word here through song, and recognizing that your love reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness stretches to the sky. And we think about that expanse, and to our eyes, it doesn't end. The sky and the heavens, much like your love, it does not end. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your love, for your faithfulness. May we just today return just to even a small portion of that and make this space a better place. We just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you share a little love right now with one another? And we thank you for being here this morning. Praise God.
throne of God above. Lord, I recognize that who you are and recognizing that, Lord, my life is found in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the, for the world and the life that we get to enjoy here. And yet this is temporary. This is not permanent. And help me to fix my eyes on that which is eternal. Jesus Christ, I bow before the cross of Christ and marvel at this love divine. That you would do what you did for me, Lord. And that you did it for everyone. Help us to fix our eyes firmly on that, Lord. I thank you. I thank you for my need of Christ. And I thank you for opening my eyes that I might see how I once was, but how I now am in Christ. I thank you for how you see me, Lord, that really in my flesh I'm not worthy, and yet you count me worthy of saving. That you see worth and value in your creation. I say thank you, Lord. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. We sang about blessed be your name, Lord, and blessed be your name as we even come to take the tithe and offering. Blessed be your name, Lord, as we celebrate communion in a little bit. Blessed be your name when I think about uh, all the things we can rejoice in from this week. And yet, blessed be your name when we regard things that have not been pleasant to deal with in the week. Blessed be your name. Help us, Lord, to have the strength. Lord, you are that strength that provides when we are enduring those hardships and we can say blessed be your name because we have hope that is eternal we have faith that is founded on Jesus Christ who is eternal who is actually timeless and we thank you that we can celebrate it that Lord I need you I confess as we're about to sing this sound bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart Lord you are the one who guides my heart we thank you in Jesus name amen, amen.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Sit down, please. What a wonderful song. Amen. Not just for the individual who doesn't know Jesus. We know that person definitely needs God. But for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we also need Him. We are reminded frequently that he is our one defense. He is our righteousness. And we celebrate that at this time as we partake in communion together. For all who know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, we celebrate the fact that we have been given his righteousness. We've been given those white robes of righteousness. This past week, we were blessed to hear many wonderful speakers. And uh, it, was a, it was a hodgepodge of ethnicities, which was so refreshing. But one black preacher stated very strongly and just reminded us, we're all going to have the same outfit, white robes of righteousness. And it was all because of Jesus. And so as we celebrate today, I invite you to, when the bread comes around, when the cracker comes around, that you would take it and hold on to it until we've all been served. If you are not born again, then I would just encourage you to pass it on to the person beside you because it, it means nothing to you. Uh, it's just a cracker, okay? For us as believers, it's a reminder that Jesus, God himself, came in the flesh, he made himself man, fully God, fully man. When the cup comes around, you will be served. And if you would, just take the cup, drink it down, and put it back in, and then you serve the person next to you. And again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all that is is grape juice. But if you do know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it's still grape juice. But it reminds us. It's a fantastic reminder that were it not for the blood of Jesus Christ, we would not have forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And I was telling the people in Sunday school this morning how thankful I am as we are reading through Leviticus that we don't all have to have these large pastures with all kinds of sheep to sacrifice always because we all sin. The glory is Jesus came as the Lamb of God. And when he died on the cross, it was finished. Never more is another sacrifice needed because Jesus paid it all.
So think about those things as you participate in the communion this morning. Brother Corey, would you lead us in prayer, please? This isn't Grandpa's house, no. Yeah. Okay, let's pray together. You ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you um, for each of these young people who are here today. Lord, we thank you for um, bringing them here to hear your word. And we um, thank you for their teachers as well, Lord. Pray that you would... Um, Help their teachers to know exactly what it is they need to hear today, Lord. Give them the words mm -hmm. and give these children opening, open hearts to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, first of all, Janita and I want to thank all of you for your prayers this past week. Our desire was that God would use the a Bible conference to inspire us, to motivate us, to renew us, and he did just that. And we're very grateful for your prayers on that. Um, I also need to uh, just uh, comment on a few things. Uh, I, I said some of this during uh, Sunday school, but uh, you need to be aware that God uses his children in a variety of ways, and, and they are sometimes even famous uh, for the glory of God, uh, Dean Neal's uh, MCI Jazz Group, Jazz Vocal Group, uh, they took first at uh, Berkeley, uh, at the contest there at Berkeley, and so to God be the glory for that. Good job, Dean. So, and we can certainly applaud that. Um, also, uh, we've got some good bodyguards here in our church growing up. Uh, Joshua Brown took first in his division in the wrestling tournament, is that correct? So, I, and uh, Calvin uh, Peck, he took second place in his division. And uh, so that's great. So we need to give them a, a hand as well. And, and John, John, as I understand it, had a very vital part in his training, as I think uh, Joshua broke one of your bones or something one time. So... We also, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, will be having a graduation ceremony. Uh, we will be remembering with gratitude to the Lord uh, the life of Bob Lampson. And so uh, I, I was thinking about that as we were singing, and I thought, you know what? This is like a graduation ceremony uh, because he has left this planet to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so, if you are able to be here to be a blessing, to be an encouragement, and to be blessed by the family and the Word, uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon, uh, you are certainly welcome to, to be a part of that because he is part of the family. We just don't get to shake his hand until glory. So, we're in Luke 15, 11 through 32. You have an outline. It's called The Proud, the Pauper, and the Prince. And yes, I do come up with this stuff. I'm sick. But there's no known cure for it. Let me just ask you a question. Do you believe that there's only one way in which a sinner can be restored? Would you agree with that statement, that there's only one way in which a sinner could be restored? Okay. And some of you are doing this, and some of you are going, it's a trick question. For those of you who said it's a trick question, you're right, it is a trick question. Uh, no, there's not just one way, but there is one way through Jesus Christ, okay? But as far as methodology, as far as how this person can be restored, uh, I would hope not. Because in the previous uh, two parables which we have studied, and uh, the one which we'll be studying together today, 
we actually find three different ways of restoring that which was lost. You recall with the first individual how um, uh, foolishness, wandering around, doing their own thing caused that lostness with that sheep, okay? And even though there was absent-mindedness, there was carelessness that caused the lostness, the shepherd still searched. Isn't that encouraging? The shepherd still searched until that sheep was found, and then he, you got to help me here, he rejoiced. Okay, I know, it's been a, a hard week, but let's, let's uh, you got to help me out here or I'll fall asleep in the middle of my sermon. That would be terrible. Okay, then there was that coin, the second parable, the coin that was lost due to carelessness of someone else. The coin didn't go out and lose itself. It was lost. And you think about it, life could have gone on without searching for the coin, right? Life could have gone on. But because the owner, the lady, understood the intrinsic value of that coin, she searched for it until it was found, and she rejoiced. Okay, we're, we're priming the pump here. That's good. She then rejoiced. Well, today, we're going to come upon a situation that happens far too commonly. Someone becomes lost because of their own stubbornness and their own intentionality. And today's character chose willfully to become lost. And we'll be seeing a whole new method of restoration that requires a great deal of hope and trust. So what I want us to come out of today, just remembering this next thing, is for the person who gets intentionally lost, okay, and we may have been that person or we may know of that person, for the one who intentionally gets lost, we wait for God to work, then we celebrate, we rejoice when that person is finally found. Okay? Now, I am always convinced that if you are here, hopefully it's not because, well, what's the pastor going to think if we don't show up this Sunday? No, that's, that's not why you're here. You're here because you listened to God's prompting that you needed to be here. And if you're on the World Wide Web and you happen to click on this and you're viewing this, it's because God has something from His Word that you need to hear today. Okay? So we're going to be looking at two primary factors that are seen as a result of what goes on in the heart, okay? So in your outline, you've got two major points and then several sub-points underneath those major points, okay? And my children, when I say major point, they all go major point. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're weird. So first is that of actions, Okay? We're going to look, first of all, at actions that take place as a result of what's going on in the heart. And second is that of attitudes. Okay, So take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read this passage together, except for those that have babies um, that want to stay seated. Jesus is speaking, and he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together, and he went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make, make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he's come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Father, as we look into this passage and the verses shortly following this, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us. Get me out of the way, God. Let Jesus be seen. Please sit down. In these verses, we see actions which take place as a result of different choices which were made. Now, obviously, actions and choices are a result of what is going on in the heart, right? So we're going to take a look at how this breaks down. The first sub-point is the wrong choice, okay? We see that in verses 11 and 12. This is the wrong choice. We're introduced here by Luke to a new parable, still in the same context as as the previous two parables, but Jesus keeps on hammering so that these guys get it a little better if it's possible. This parable gives us the knowledge that there is a father and two sons involved in it. Now, we don't know much about the older son yet, do we? We're going to find a little bit about him a little later on. So the focus for now is on the younger of the two sons. And sadly, we read here of a request that is strange and unusual. It's it's also a very unwise request. So immediately, we're introduced to a character that we probably would say this guy is pretty headstrong. He wants to do things his own way, and he's into immediate gratification. He's unwilling to wait for the appropriate time for the inheritance. That immediate pleasure and satisfaction was probably how he operated since he couldn't wait for his inheritance. Well, let's just consider the lack of wisdom in getting his share of the estate at this time of his life. Further, you know, first of all, you you look and you say any further growth in the land accumulation or the value of goods and material stuff like that, all that growth is no longer available to him. He's going to get his share right now based upon that snapshot of the worth of the estate. And since the eldest son always got double portion, that means he got a third of the whole estate, a third of all that his dad had worked so hard for. Second, it would be safe to assume that he probably doesn't have the wisdom, especially because he's asking for it now, or the skill set to properly manage his portion of the estate. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to put two and two together and kind of see where this is going to go, even if you've never heard about this parable. But even worse is because he asked for his share of the estate, his portion of the inheritance at that particular point in time, He's basically telling his dad, Dad, I don't need you anymore. There's no value in you hanging around. Because when you got your share of the estate, it was usually on the father's deathbed. Dad, you might as well go kick the bucket. What a sad commentary on the wrong choices that this young man made. That's not the worst part. 
we go into verses 13 through 16 and we see the wasteful choice. Not only did he make a wrong choice, but now he's going to make a wasteful choice as you look at these verses. Luke lets us know that these wasteful choices were not going to be a long time in coming. In fact, Luke says, not many days later. So the youngest son, he gets everything organized, everything put together, rented a U-Haul truck, and he took off someplace far away to a distant land. That phrase means it wasn't close by. It was far away. Now, why didn't he just go up the road? Why not take his share of the inheritance and invest it in someplace close by? With his attitude that we kind of can guess with his wrong choices, he probably had burned some bridges, don't you suppose? Scripture is silent. It's a parable. It's meant to teach a lesson. He probably already knew that he did not want to listen to Big Brother saying, boy, that was stupid. What were you thinking of? How disrespectful you are to Dad. You don't want to hang around for that. And if you do make some mistakes, you don't want Dad saying, didn't you pay any attention to how I raised you? You think about it, probably was already in his heart that he was going to be frivolous, don't you think? Just by asking for everything up front like that. You know, a sad commentary on our society and upon us many times as well is that we may think we have everything under control. We may think that, okay, if I blow it, if I do something a little bit wrong, you know what? I can still get back on the right path. Oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I'll go ahead and I'll slip over here into this gray zone. Which the only reason it's gray is because our vision is not clear. We don't see that it's black versus white. The heart was already not right. So this man continued on his path. Luke writes, he squandered his estate with loose living. The King James and the New Living Translation use the word wasted. He wasted his estate. Now we might wonder, okay, what's loose living? What, what is loose living? Does that mean he should have had a belt on or suspenders on? Some other translations use the word wild living, reckless living. Living. I like that one. The King James uses the word prodigal, which interestingly, that word only came out in the 1500s. Regardless, this younger brother took his inheritance early, and he didn't use it for providing for himself. He didn't use it to set things up and provide for his future family. He did not use any of this estate for the glory of God. But instead, he used it on his own personal pleasure that was not honoring to the family or to the Lord. But that's not the end. Verse 14 states that things were getting extremely difficult for this fellow because of a severe famine. Is God in charge? I'd say so. Now, again, this is a parable. It's not a true story, but the principles are there to teach a spiritual truth. However, you and I know God does things like this to get the attention of those he wants to restore. The idea behind the word impoverished is that of someone who is in great need or want to the point of not even having enough food to eat. It's further explained in verse 16 by suggesting that he would have been glad to eat what was normally given to the pigs. Now, I remember growing up, my, my grandparents had this white uh, metal bucket, and it had this cool, um, like an accelerator step on it. You step on it, and the lid pops open. I thought that was so cool, especially if you pull back and bang, just so fun. Grandma and Grandpa didn't appreciate that. Do you know what they put in there? Scraps. 
any leftovers. That was our garbage disposal. And every day before the evening feeding of the hogs, Grandpa would lift that out of there and take it out and put it in the bottom of the trough for the hogs before he put all the grain and stuff in there. Okay, that was our scrap bucket. It wasn't a bucket. It was about this tall. Of course, when you're a kid, you think it's about this tall. But, it, you know, about that tall. So the, the pea pods are the part of the pea that we wouldn't eat before they came out with edible shells, okay? So he would have been happy with that, but it's out going to the pigs, and you don't take away from them. In addition, and you've got to remember, Jesus is telling a story to the Pharisees, right? What is a good Jewish boy doing in a pig pen? Ceremonially, he was completely unclean. And Jesus is about to show what he wants to do for those who are unclean, for those who are lost. Most Jewish religious leaders, scholars suggest, would have renounced this fellow because he had renounced his Jewish heritage. It was as if he had left and become worse than a Gentile. Well, now he is seriously face to face with the harsh reality of how his earlier choices, his earlier actions had led to such terrible decisions. He was being profoundly impacted. He's about to face a major decision here. Well, instead of the wrong choice, we're going to see in verses 17 through 19 the right choice. I like what Luke says, as he came to his senses. No light bulbs, but there had to be a, a lamp that came up on, above his head. As he came to his senses, he realized, here's the reality. He was the son of a wealthy man. How do we know he's wealthy? He had servants. And as a son, he could have had whatever he needed or wanted. And he thought to himself, man, I, I could have had all that, and my dad's hired men, they have more than I do. Remember, he just came away with a third of the estate, and the hired men have more than he currently has. They're not even sons. They're just hired men. He says, they have more than enough, but I'm dying with hunger. You, <laughs> you almost hear the song playing in his head, I can see clearly now. It's like he could have had a V8, but he just made wrong choices. See, it's not just that he has nothing anymore. It's that he didn't even recognize who he was. He didn't recognize that he was the son of a very good, wealthy individual. See, it wasn't really about possessions. It wasn't really about property. It wasn't really about prizes at the end of the day. It was about poverty, spiritual poverty. Okay. That's not to put you to sleep. That's for the sake of a baby. So, okay, It's about his spiritual poverty. But he realized at this point something was not right. He understood about all the wrong and wasteful choices from the bad attitudes. That's, that's one thing. And, and, and people, we can get it sometimes, right? We sometimes say, because I did this and this and this, <sighs> Look where I'm at now. But what do you do with that? That's really the question. What are you going to do about it? Here's where we see this young man finally getting it, right? He's about to make some right choices. In fact, he develops a plan. He develops a plan that has several steps. Now, you and I see that he has a humble spirit. Well, we know what the Bible says, that God 
brings down the arrogant, but he lifts up and exalts the humble. This young man's starting to have a humble spirit. In fact, he doesn't have any inclination in his mind whatsoever to say, hey, Dad, I didn't get enough. I need some more. There's no entitlement spirit there. He doesn't even have a demanding spirit about him. He understands the core issue is his heart. He is a sinner. And he plans on letting his dad know that he understands that he ultimately sinned against God and as a result also against his family. He recognizes that he's lost. He is not worthy of any consideration. He has thoroughly blown it. But what I love to see here is that he wants to be in the presence of his dad. Even if it's just as a slave. He wants to go back home. How many people want to do that? We live in a world that is so full of pride and arrogance that nobody wants to go back and say, I'm sorry, I blew it. Can I just be with you, O oh God? R.C. Sproul explains it this way. He says, here we have the essence of conversion. That moment in a human being's life when they come to themselves and realize that they have sinned. Not that they've made a mistake or not that they've been guilty of error in judgment. And I hear that so much it makes me want to get physically sick. But the reality that they have sinned. And in true repentance, contrition breaks through. He goes on, he says, the illusions are shattered, the games are over, and the man said, I will go and tell the truth. Can you imagine what would happen in our White House if that happened? Can you imagine in our homes what would happen? Can you imagine in business what would happen if people would just go back and say, I will go and tell the truth? Well, put yourself in the role of the dad now. You don't know what's going on in your son's head. We know what the son was planning on doing, but the dad didn't. So as the son, as the younger son, you might ask yourself, will my father accept me? Will my father even allow me to be a hired man? Would my dad say, son, You've blown it too many times. You've got to prove yourself. You've got to give me a year, six months, two years. You've got to prove yourself to me before I'll give you the time of day. Would the father have felt that the son had so betrayed the family, besmirched the family name, that he'd say, you're dead to me. Don't even bother. Well, let's check it out. Look at verses 20 and 24 where we see the father's choice. Luke lets us in on, I think, the most incredible scene ever described in a parable. The son was heading home to his father with the speech in mind, and because we know it was a far journey, a distant land, a distant country, that he probably had a long way to go. And like many of us, we don't know this, but he might have had second thoughts along the way, but then he realized, I'm hungry, and I've made some stupid choices. He keeps on going. But look at the second sentence in verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, Think about it. His father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now, before we go any farther, I want to point out a couple things. Um, first of all, fathers of that age with adult children don't normally go running out. They don't normally go running any place. 
because they were to carry themselves with dignity. Okay? They were to carry themselves with dignity. So we have him running out. If anybody's going to run, it better be the child. Right? But let me go back a little farther. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. My friends, do you see the picture of Jesus in this? The father wasn't a slouch. He was probably out there working every day. But from this, we get the idea that the father must have been looking every day. It doesn't say that. But folks, he didn't get a telegram saying, hey, your son's on his way back. It says, the father saw him from a long way off, and he felt compassion for him. I wrote something down the other day. Hold on to it. The son may have left the father's house, but he never left the father's heart. That's you and me. Sometimes we want to go our own way. Right? We want to do it our way because, God, you just don't understand. You don't know what I've gone through, and so I'm going to do it my way. We may leave the relationship with our Father, but we can never leave His heart. You think about the son. Probably lost a few pounds. Probably looked pretty grubby and scrubby. And the father runs out there to him. He, he must have known how far down his son had gone. Probably because he knew his son. And rather than despise him, rather than wanting to shame him, he felt a compassion. He says, he embraced him and kissed him. Now, in our culture, we don't really get that. But in that culture, that was a sign of forgiveness. Look at the order here. The son doesn't say anything to him until after the father had already forgiven him. Folks, that's good news. Jesus longs and waits for us. He waits for the worn and weary souls to come to him so that he can lovingly forgive them and restore them. The father could see the heart of his younger son. Our heavenly father knows our hearts and our thoughts before a word even comes out of our mouths, doesn't he? The son did go on in verse 21 to fulfill what his plan was. He even went so far to tell his dad, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I look at that, I'm going, wow. Dad, hand over my estate. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Night and day difference, isn't it? But look what the father does in verses 22 through 24. And again, we in the West missed a lot of this, right? He gives instructions to get a great party ready, right? That's awesome. And he wants his son clothed in the best of garments because his son is now truly alive. Beforehand, spiritually, he was dead. 
And for all practical purposes, his absence could have been because he was dead. Now, he was certainly lost in his sin, but now he's truly alive. He confessed his sin. He confessed his own unworthiness. And only the Father had the authority to pardon him and declare him alive and clothe him in the very best. That's the way it is with us and God, isn't it? So the celebration begins, but not everyone is so enthusiastic. If actions were seen as a result of the heart, making bad choices, then good ones... Our next section is going to be focusing upon attitudes. Verses 25 through 32. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he, the father, said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Now, now here, the actions of big brother may have been appropriate and good, right? But the attitude was just as bad as little brother's earlier actions. And interestingly, you'll find this to be almost always true. Attitudes are often a result of what is driving a person in their motivation. Is everything that is done by us motivated for appearance and approval? Or is what we do motivated by obedience and honor to God? I like to look at this a little bit and suggest that we need to do a self-evaluation in our own lives. It's been suggested that the younger brother represented the taxpayers and sinners that were listening to Jesus. So guess who the older brother represents? The Pharisees and scribes who really didn't have a heart for the people, but only for their own position and status. Well, let's look at this. In verses 25 through 30, we see the wrong motivation. See, the older son, he was out doing what he's supposed to do. He was out in the field doing his job. So he hadn't realized that his younger brother had actually come back home. Now, as he gets closer to home, he realized, hey, there's a party going on. I wonder what's happened here. Now, nothing was on the calendar. Something unusual must have taken place. So he gathers information from one of the servants, and the servant responded with that joyous message that their father was throwing a party because the youngest son had come back safe and sound. But look what the older brother does. Instead of being pleased and happy, it says he became angry and was not willing to go in, which is an absolute insult to the father. Of course, the father wants the whole family together, and instead of demanding that the older son comes in, he goes out to get him. And sadly, the older brother's attitude was extremely negative. How many of you are oldest children? Yeah. We probably can identify with this older brother, can't we? I have felt this way many times. I have done everything I'm supposed to do. I jumped when you said jump. I even said how high when you said jump, and I did it. But this younger or this other employee or this student, and they get all kinds of blessings. What do I get? Right? 
And if you've never thought that way, I need some counseling. The son is stating here, I've never disobeyed you. My brother parties. He does all kinds of foolish things with prostitutes. Dad, you never offered me anything special. How unfair is that? What is the point of being the obedient, compliant, hardworking son if the wastrel is the one who gets honored and treated like royalty? Can you identify? Do you feel that little twinge of anger in your spirit? And you don't have to be the oldest child, by the way. And I'm not suggesting that my young brothers were wastrels. <laughs> they do things that I couldn't do and wouldn't do. They're amazing. But we have that attitude and spirit in ourselves sometimes, don't we? I do all the right stuff. I memorized all the Bible verses, and this person memorized one verse, and they get the same prize I get. Don't get me started on participation prizes. Maybe the older brother didn't do the shameful, horrible actions that his younger brother committed. However, the older brother's heart was very critical and very prideful. He was exhibiting anger that was not at all righteous. The older brother didn't rejoice at his younger brother's repentance. In fact, it seems that he was not forgiving at all. And he was upset that his being found was a cause for this big celebration. But listen to the father's answer in verses 31 through 32. Look at your Bibles and see that. The father basically reminds the son, you got everything. Think about it logically. I already gave him his share. Everything else that you see here, it's yours. All that you see is yours. You're not being dishonored. Actually, the younger son's actually beginning to live. Now, the reality is property can be renegotiated, reestablished. That's up to the dad. It's not up to the older son. It's up to the dad. That which was lost is now found. What else could we do but celebrate? And I like verse 32. He was dead and has begun to live. Isn't that wonderful? That's the story of salvation, isn't it? We were lost. We were dead. When we say yes to Jesus, we've begun to live. So in conclusion, if anything is learned today, please understand a simple principle. Good behavior, avoiding bad behavior, does not save a person. A person is saved when they come to Christ with humble hearts, with a repentant spirit, recognizing that there is no good thing that is deserved by any of us. What a wonderful picture of this younger brother who was wanting to have his inheritance before the proper time, got involved with the dregs of society, who ended up with nothing to eat, no hopes for the future, then to have his father give him the festive robe, being given shoes to show that he was not a slave. That was symbolic. If you had shoes, you were not a slave. You were a free man. And then that signet ring showing that he indeed belonged to his father. It wasn't just a bling effect. It wasn't that. It was all about understanding who he was. Now, my friends, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, it's time to take stock of your life right now, of who you are. It's time to go to your Lord and to ask for his forgiveness to go to him and own up to your sins, plead with him for mercy, forgiveness, and grace. And you know what? I can promise you something based upon the promises of the Bible that you will experience forgiveness and you will be given a brand new life. You know, this is who we were and who we now are in Jesus Christ. You see, we thought we had all that we needed. We could handle life ourselves. 
We felt we were just fine with who we are and what we had. And you know what? If not, we just work harder. We just dig deeper. We just do more good things and stay away from some bad things. And if we do some bad things, we'll do some more good things. That doesn't work, does it? Or maybe we just bought into the philosophy, I'm going to grab all the gusto I can get. I'm going to live for today. And then we came to that desperate moment when we understood that we were so hopelessly lost. We knew that we had nothing to offer. We knew that we didn't deserve anything. But we would have just been so happy to be in the presence of God, to know that he loved us, to know that we would not be condemned to eternity in hell. And then when we confessed our sin, we offered ourselves to Christ. You know what he does? He invites us to be his guests at the great wedding party, that great celebration. He takes off all of our grimy, filthy rags, and you know what he does? He puts on us his glorious robes of righteousness. He identifies us as children of God for all eternity. We're no longer slaves in the marketplace of sin serving Satan. We're given the shoes of the gospel of peace as there's no longer anything preventing our access to our dear Lord. Now, folks, this has a lot of focus on salvation, but let me just suggest something. We talked in Sunday school about how the Bible is relevant to all parts of life. There may be some things that you personally are going through in your life that you're saying, I've had it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm fed up. I'm not going to keep going that route because I'm not getting satisfaction. Things aren't working out the way I want them to work out. Folks, none of us are greater than God. The Bible is always true. It's always accurate. Do things the Bible way. Hang in there because whatever battle you and I are facing, we're not fighting it alone. All we have to do is just turn to Jesus and say, I'm your child. I know that. But right now, I'm sick of life as it is. And he will say to you, come, I'm walking with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why are you thinking that? I have begun a good work in you, and I'm going to carry it on to completion until the day that my son comes to take you home. Whatever it is you're going through, come back home. You see, even as a child, we can want to run away, can't we? Even as a legitimate heir of Christ... We can want to do things our way. Why would you want to settle for pig food? But you know something? If pig food is what God wants to give me, I'll take it from his hand any day of the week because I know he wants to make me to be more like Jesus. Isn't it worth it? So my friends... For the one who intentionally gets lost, we wait for God to work. Then we celebrate when that person is found. When you and I feel like we'd like to just boot this whole Christian thing and get lost, please understand something. There are people praying for you, and they will wait for God to work in your life. You just have to listen to God. And please don't say, well, if this person really loved me, they'd come talk to me. They'd come help straighten this out. No, that's not true at all. Remember, there's more than one way to be reconciled, to come back home. I was sharing with someone this morning 
that I would pray for a situation. And then I made the stupid remark, it's the least I can do. I don't know why I say those things. It's actually the most I can do. Because I can't change a heart. But he is in the heart-changing business. Let's stand as we pray together. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that our Savior, your Son, shared this parable. We truly stand amazed in your presence that you, Jesus, chose to die to purchase my salvation. But we are so grateful and glad that you are not dead now. You raised from the dead, you sit at the right hand of the Father, and you continually intercede for us. Father, for anyone here today who maybe doesn't know Jesus Christ yet as their personal Lord and Savior, whether they're here or sometime in the future listening to this broadcast, I pray that your Spirit would move on their hearts and draw them to salvation through Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's someone here today or listening that's just really struggling with a situation, with life, with a crisis, whatever it may be, help them to know that they can come back to you, that they can humble their hearts, seek forgiveness, and lean upon your strength as you walk them through whatever that might be. Father, we thank you for your incredible love. And as we continue to celebrate the fellowship we have as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we pray, Father, that you will bless the food that we're going to be sharing together. You would bless our conversation so that we will lift one another up to the glory of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.